the Labor government were being the very champion that I would have wanted the National Party to have been. The real trick was to sell the merit of that to my colleagues. We can begin to build a better New Zealand. We can do it together. We will do it. I believe the 1990s will be New Zealand's decade. Yeah, yeah. The decade in which we rediscover the energy and self-confidence of old. We believe the time has come to recognise that the big moves are behind us and a different style of management is called for. Conflict over the direction of the Labour government's second term in office culminated in a series of bitter public rows. And finally, on the 7th of August 1989, in the departure of Prime Minister David Longy. My friend, I'm sorry to see you go. Can I tell you, Geoffrey? I've changed my mind. <laughs> the leadership of the fourth Labour government has collapsed and the party is self-destructing. In its dying days, the job of tidying up is left to the man who always got things done, Geoffrey Palmer. Your elected leader. Yeah, great job, eh? <laughs> What, what were your feelings? Well, I thought that what you had to do was try and keep the ship afloat for as long as you could, really, and um, I didn't. Th I thought the government was doomed, uh, actually, and, and my wife was absolutely of that opinion. So why did you do it? Well, I thought I had a duty to do it, and, and um, to try and get as many of the reforms completed. We did complete a fair number. The Reserve Bank Act went through, the Public Finance Act went through, the Bill of Rights Act went through. I particularly wanted the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act. Thank you very much. But all of this happening, under the un, under a sense of impending doom. Sure, well, that's politics, isn't it? <laughs> Although David Longy and Roger Douglas had gone, the economic agenda was still running. It was left to David Cagle as finance minister to tick the last items off the Labour list. Among them, the Public Finance Act, the Reserve Bank Act, and with Richard Preble's help, the last, the largest, and the most controversial of the public asset sales. Welcome. Thank Hello. you very much. I'm Lou Ritigliano from Ameritech. Very nice Welcome. to meet you. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Phil Campbell from Bell Atlantic. In 1987 and 88, the partial float of the BNZ and the sale of Air New Zealand had met with strong opposition. But the jewel in the crown, Telecom, despite widespread public protest, was sold to American interests for $4.2 billion, with only 10 members of the Labour caucus voting against it. I can recall the problems that we had in selling 17% of the Bank of New Zealand privatising it. But two and a half years later, I watched the caucus sell telecom uh, without any debate, apart from five or six people who were fundamentally still opposed to it. Most of them were reading newspapers yawning, saying, when do we get on to the next item? And there had been a fundamental shift in the way people who had been closely involved thought about it. We're here today to announce the sale of Telecom Corporation of New Zealand. Standard residential For those who believed government should stay out of the business of public utilities, this was their finest hour. Government as owner would simply not have had the courage or the ability to go through with the process to the extent that we've gone through it. The demonstrated track record of government as owner of businesses in New Zealand was a, was a disaster for decades. What we've seen in New Zealand is that a small group of people have probably become very wealthy of the privatisations. They would argue, of course, they have improved the profit performance of these companies. I and others would probably argue that it was inevitable with the changes in technology that were, had, had come in worldwide, that once they were introduced in New Zealand, that, that, would, that, that would probably, the profit would have increased um, no matter who ran them. Telecom brought the asset sales total to 8.3 billion. At the same time, the effect of economic reforms was forcing the government to dig deeper into its pocket. As the country headed into a recession, spending on health, education and welfare increased steadily. Between 1984 and 1989, unemployment benefits rose by 260%, sickness benefits by 166%, accommodation benefits by 142%. Treasury was keen to change the way social services were delivered too. But although Labour introduced some limited changes, radical reform was a no-go area. 
one thing that we did not do was to cut the social welfare benefits or anything of that sort. We maintained the social welfare programs, the income maintenance programs, we enhanced them in some respects, we were trying to do things for women, we had big, big women's policies. We, we were not a, a minimalist government. We were not a government that said that the state's purpose is to do nothing. We were committed to the welfare state. Indeed, in many ways, the government fell apart over a disagreement about that. The public disagreement over social spending was a timely boost for the Conservative opposition, at last beginning to recover from the shock of two consecutive defeats. 1984 to 1987, the Nats didn't budge an inch from the, well, we are born to rule, and they sulked. We've been tossed out of office. We did nothing by way of vision for our party, renewal, strategy, uh, attractive policy, nothing. We just sulked. And we hoped, as a government, to capitalise on the chaos that inevitably had been caused. I mean, you don't make an omelette without breaking the eggs. And we thought the simple act of breaking the eggs and shifting radically people's expectations would of itself mean a harvest of votes for us. Well, how very wrong we were. <laughs> but by 1989, National had stopped licking its wounds and reformed from within to become a government in waiting again. And for them, there was no line in the sand between economic reform and social reform. We knew the time had come for the second wave of reform. We needed to move into the no-go areas, the no-go areas for labour, the labour market, social policy, the size and the role of the state. And just as we had seen a Labour government courageously, as you would expect, show leadership, given that those were the imperatives they had to deal with, so also we were ready to show that leadership, but we showed our hand before the election. In 1990, in the run-up to the elections, on our executive, for example, we had senior, well-experienced, in the terms of union experience, members of that executive saying, the Tories could never be worse than this lot. It sounds incredible now. We were trying to say, look, they are going to be, because the skinning knife's out, we know what the round table's agenda is for labour market deregulation, uh, they're going to come for us. E we either have a strategy of leading the change or we're going to be run over by change. The trade union movement weren't the only people to see the writing on the wall. With an election approaching, Labour panicked. I think that uh, people got the tatars towards the end of 1990 because, I mean, they could see their seats disappearing and that has an effect on MPs. Um, but most of the people, and, and the other thing, a lot of ministers were already decided they'd give up. You see, they were all retiring. Rafts of ministers retiring. That's not a good thing. Palmer's days were numbered. In a desperate coup orchestrated by Helen Clark, the Labour leadership changes yet again just seven weeks from an election. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've told the Labour Party caucus today that I am standing down from the leadership of the Labour Party and from the Prime Ministership. Can you tell us why, why you felt it was necessary to make a run for the job at this stage? It was the others who found it necessary to, uh, to approach me. New Zealand gets its third Prime Minister in six years. You know, I was actually pretty, pretty <laughs> pleased to get out at the end of 1990. I was, I was quite happy to run through uh, as Prime Minister and take the defeat, but if other people wanted to do it, be my guest. Now look, we believe in open government, but I don't think we should have the cameras all through the cabinet meeting. <laughs> it is now the Mike Moore show, and it's in for a short run. The image polishing isn't going to help. <laughs> In six short weeks, the party which had launched the most dramatic reform the nation had seen since the first Labour government would swap sides with a Conservative party. Labour had pulled back from health, housing and labour market deregulation and for most of those six years they'd had an easy ride from the opposition. Now a new national government was going to pick up the ball and take it where Labour had feared to go. We can begin to build a better New Zealand. We can do it together. We will do it. Thank you very much.
<laughs> like the 84 Labour government, National takes power in a crisis too. Labour had overspent, the economy turned down sharply, and the BNZ was in danger of going belly up. The National Government's first Cabinet today had to face two economic bombshells. First, the news that the BNZ had $2.8 billion worth of loans in trouble in Australia, and the $620 million needed to prop up the Australian end of the bank had to be added to a new deficit projection. This indicates that because of the Clyde Dam, increased social welfare expenditure, the DFC bailout and various other government expenditure increases, the small surplus predicted on budget night has now become a $1 billion deficit for the 1990-91 financial year. Crisis management provides another platform for a hidden agenda. Ruth Richardson uses it to persuade her Prime Minister Jim Bolger to move quickly on the policy ideas she'd been developing over the past three years. It's like a rerun of 1984 with different actors. In a way it gave us uh, a running start in terms of a relationship. We were focused by events. I always had the big picture in my mind uh, and the way in which we handled those events advanced the bigger picture. Look happy. The problems are not all that bad, and it's all the Labour Party's fault. Muldoon in 1975, he had got a huge electoral mandate and had squandered it. And there was a determination, which of course we reformers used to our advantage, a determination in our ranks that when we got our chance, every minute was going to count, we were going to do it once and do it properly, and not hang around. Thanks. Welcome, Treasurer. Thank you very much. Can I, can I introduce you to some of my colleagues? Ruth Richardson wasted no time. Within two months, she had a mini-budget ready to advance the revolution. There was no question of the Treasury capturing the agenda. People like Graham Scott and his colleagues will tell you, we came to office ready to hit the ground running. We had our agenda. We wanted advice only to implement that agenda. The advice was more the action stations, not the ideas. The Prime Minister and his Finance Minister had the welfare state in their sights when they unveiled their budget. Their remedy for economic prosperity is not a pleasant one for many. It is very clear that we must stop deluding ourselves about our wealth and stop spending money that we do not have. There is still much work to be done to control, reduce and eliminate the government's deficit over three years. The October announcement locks in the second stage of the revolution. The biggest and hardest blow was a 10% cut in benefits. From April the 1st, the single unemployment benefit will be cut $14. The sickness benefit will be cut $27. Couples with children and solo parents face a benefit loss of between $25 and $27 a week. Also from April, the universal payment for family benefit will be abolished. But their intentions on other issues are less obvious. A task force on health has announced a review of social services, a review of housing, moves towards individual wage bargaining and an ambivalent fudge on superannuation surtax. For all that, National was resolved to deal to the welfare state from the start, just as the fourth Labour government had dealt to the farmers first. One night we went to Parliament, we put the price of interest on a farm up about 50%, cut the value of a farm by 50%, and I said to my colleagues, you know, what, what on earth is going to happen if another government comes in? What if they hang out our, our beneficiaries on the line as we've done the farmer? And of course later that came to be true. The new government also made an onslaught on the relationship between workers and employees, bringing in the Employment Contracts Act and an end to collective bargaining. The days of the ritual wage rounds and accompanying government union standoffs were numbered. The trade unions were a creature of the system. Just as somebody who went on the dole was just reading the signals right, was, was, was a, a victim of the system. It was the system that I was railing against. It was the system that we redesigned, and the system was state imposition and control. National up! National up! The Employment Contracts Act was deliberately intended to individualise the employment relationship. It was a nat natural outcome of the ideological propaganda of rugged individualism, of self-interest and greed, and the appeal to, uh, to individuals that you could find better 
for you than by, by climbing over the tops of your mates and your colleagues and so on. Ruth Richardson was very clear, very blunt, very honest about its purpose. It was to achieve a dramatic lowering of wages very, very quickly. Employers hailed the move as an end to outdated labour management relations and an end to union control of the work environment. That was the environment that business had to cope with. That was before the Employment Contracts Act and uh, we had all the old crazy union practices like on the wharves that held this country to ransom for so long. And uh, uh, those work practices in many cases were the critical factor as to why we couldn't become competitive and that's why so many businesses closed down. I think it's a shift of control symptomatic with what's been going on in the economy at large, away from both those groups to consumers. That's really what's happened. And a realisation in an open economy, Employment Contract Act or not, that if the brewery worker and the brewery manager don't get together to make products that consumers want for a price they're prepared to pay, they're both out of a job. So the elimination of tariffs and the freeing up of the economy generally, I think would have caused much of it to happen, of what has happened, the ECA merely allowed it to happen quicker. In July 1991, against the background of Saddam Hussein's Gulf War, Ruth Richardson presents her mother of all budgets and pushes the revolution into its last phase. It takes bold measures to change history. Tonight, we are producing a bold budget. The measures foreshadowed in the Minister's mini-budget are put in place. A radical shake-up for the health system. Hospitals renamed Cheese to be run like businesses under contract to new funding agencies, the RHAs. User pays is extended in health and continued in education. Student fees, which were to be abolished, are continued. Housing becomes a business too, with a cash supplement to help the poor pay market rents. The welfare state is no longer sacred or safe. The redesign of the welfare state is integral to our strategy for growth. The future is ours to make. It is in our hands. But for some, the future looks pretty bleak. National has broken its promise to repeal the tax on superannuation. Um, some shock here. George Drain, what do you think of that package? To me, it's a political disaster and likely to be the total destruction of the National Party as a body. But doesn't the government have to do something? Yes, but they don't have to take it away from people who try. And they don't have to take it away from the poorer people who need. You're pretty upset about that. I aren't you? am. I really am. Well, I think it was fairly predictable because they also were, didn't hide this. They were very honest and open and gave us all a pamphlet and our own letterboxes explaining to us exactly what sort of reality was, was, was about to hit us. And as far as they were concerned, um, they were about as idiot, probably more ideological. I think at that stage, uh, Labor had had some experience uh, as government of power and of the consequences that were emerging. So you had the new kids on the block who were all full of enthusiasm and with the support obviously of the interests that had originally supported Labour and therefore were pursuing their self-interest in good market terms. Um, so they galloped off as a pack of ideologues like the others. <laughs> If New Zealanders thought they'd voted to stop the juggernaut of change, they were rudely disillusioned. The government, via Ruth Richardson, had delivered even stronger medicine. No sector is left untouched by the reformist zeal of the Minister of Finance and her colleagues. The rage and despair in the electorate was alarming for a government party accustomed to winning elections, but unaccustomed to leading revolutions. Prime Minister Jim Bolger had gone about as far as he could go. He started to distance himself from his hyperactive finance minister. You, you, can, you can understand that. He is a prime minister acting courageously as no other prime minister had. You know, for a hundred years nobody had, had really rethought our industrial relations. For 50 years nobody had dared touch the essential tenets of the welfare state. And for a generation we'd never balanced the books. So he is, he is a... a person who by instinct is, is a maintenance of the status quo man 
you know, he's in office because he enjoys it and he's a man of the moment and, and will play his cards accordingly. Against all that instinct, having his feet held to the fire with me as sort of scratchy hair shirt, I, you can understand a human sense. I understood that. But that was not going to deflect me from the task. I think Ruth did an excellent job, but frankly, uh, after 1991, uh, she was a caretaker, much as I was in 1988. Uh, she was able to hold the line, but she wasn't able to move the agenda forward. By the time National launched stage two of the revolution, the changes in the landscape of New Zealand were plain for all to see. The country was entering a serious recession. Unemployment was soaring. The ill, homeless and dispossessed proliferated. In the cities, food banks reappeared for the first time since the 1930s. And in the rural heartlands, whole communities just melted away. The East Town Railways workshops at Whanganui after decades of being sustained by successive governments as part of social policy, were restructured and sold. People were forced to change their lives, for better or worse. Well, basically, I have to work 48 hours a week to earn less than I earned in 40 hours 10 years ago. I'm now living some, I don't know, 60 k's roughly, further away from my family my extended family than I used to when I lived in Wanganui. Um, my retirement plans of the day uh, have suffered obviously and it's had quite an effect on the children as, as well. We are having improvements now but there's no hard evidence to say that we wouldn't have had improvement anyway. Did we have to be so drastic? And, and the social effects of, of what has taken place is going to affect New Zealand right through into the next century. For example, I once said that one of the biggest problems with closing the railways is it was one of the biggest trainers of tradespeople with the apprentice scheme. And already, uh, ten years later, we're crying out for school tradespeople. We've got to import them from overseas. We don't train them anymore. I think possibly you'd have to concede that New Zealanders are maybe shaken out of their apathy. I don't like the method that was used to get them out of that apathy. I think it could have been done differently. I think that the union movement needs to be blamed for not raising early enough the slogan of make the public utilities profitable, of us leading a, a strategy for the government's change. And because we were seen to be defending the status quo, nobody, nobody believed that the status quo should be protected until it started to disappear, until it started to unravel. In 1987, when the New Zealand Forestry Service was restructured and became Forest Corp, Peter Higgins was just a cog in the giant forestry wheel. The new regime forced him to go into business for himself. With his son, he built a mill near the Golden Downs Forest where he'd worked for 10 years. Today, with the forest sold, the mill barely covers its costs and they supplement the business with a heavy machinery contracting service. Well, for the first uh, two years, three years, it went reasonably well. We employed up to eight people at one stage, but uh, with the present oversupply of timber and the lack of export um, opportunities, we're back to three men now and just um, do a more or less local market. No, times are much more difficult in all industry now than they ever were in 84. More competition, I suppose, and You've got to work pretty hard to even show a profit. You get a little bit of sick of sometimes not getting a good reward for what you do. Forestry wasn't the only industry faced with major change. Fielding was once a typical freezing works town. But in the past ten years, these works have opened and closed three times under three different owners. Once they employed a thousand people. Today they have jobs for 300. Ra Dury has worked here on and off since he was 12 years old, as did most of his relations and family. But today it's no longer the inevitable job for the community. The changes of the 80s forced him to move elsewhere to find work, and now he's returned to find his old workplace revolutionised. It's a very efficient place. It's 
it's good to work in. It's got a different atmosphere about it from the old works. The old works was pretty casual, pretty, um, pretty easy going. But this one, the fellas work well. They all want to uh, achieve tally every day. And uh, there's a lot of work for them. Those who want to work the overtime can get overtime. Probably money-wise, they're better off than the old works. Maybe today, now young fellas will start thinking a bit and uh, try and do better at school because they know they, they can't just walk into the freezing works. There's not the number of young fellas here now that, that used to be. There used to be a, well, we were all school kids when we started and there was a lot of us. So now they know it's harder to get in at May, help them do better at school. So the follow-on effect in some ways could be good. It could be good that it's all happened like this. Ra's nephew, Mehana Dury, like most of his friends, got holiday jobs at the works when he was a teenager in the 80s. Today, he teaches at the local high school, where his pupils no longer see the works as the ultimate employment. If you look back to the mid-80s, students were more inclined to finish school earlier if they had, if they had the option of walking into a guaranteed job. Um, these days, most students, just speaking from what I've seen and from my experience, most students stay on at school longer. Um, Māori students definitely are, are staying on to, to sixth, seventh form level, a lot more Māori students now than there used to be. Um, part of that has to do with the fact that the, the school leaving age was raised, was raised to 16. Um, and around this area, the fact that the freezing works did close meant that, that many young Māori um, were needed to go on to um, higher levels. In Ohakuni, the heart of the North Island ski fields, ex-farmer Peter Berry forged a new and different life after he was forced off his farm in the 80s. A different <laughs> bank gave him another chance, and he became a successful newsagent and bookseller. In the cause of survival, he turned Berry's bookshop into a thriving enterprise. It was totally different. There was nothing really related from farm life to bookshop life, from the clothing you wore when you got up in the morning to the aftershave and the underarm and the collar and tie. On. The busyness. We used to open the shop at 7 o'clock. By 9 o'clock, I suppose, you could have met anything up to 40, 50 people. Nothing related at all uh, from one to the other. Coming off the farm was a humbling experience. You felt like a failure, but the farm wasn't really a failure. It was, it was just things changed. We shouldn't put so much emphasis, I suppose, on material things, but however you do, and uh, I'm human enough to say that uh, I'm sad to see that go, but we've had a lot of uh, blessing or a lot of uh, things in other directions, and uh, it's been more than made up to us in other ways, uh, I suppose, you know, down the line. Mm. Ruth Richardson had pushed the revolution into its final stage. The pain was now spread throughout the country. But the rural sector, first target of the Labour government, had already been transformed by the revolution, and life would never be the same for many who had no reason to expect it would ever change. I guess I know who's going to be very keen to do that. Who wants to listen to Greedy Cat on this thing post? I don't. Mary McNaught of Hunterville is typical of many rural women. She expected to work alongside her husband on the farm until her children took over. Then the bank foreclosed. He chased me back to work quite quickly. And a lot of um, rural women were doing the same, and I think that we had ne I'd never thought that I would return to work. Um, I suppose semi-breadwinner. And in 85, end of 85, we sat down and looked at it, and it wasn't looking good at all, yeah, and I had to get a job quite quickly. It's rural New Zealand in general. The majority of the women are better educated than their husbands. And we've always had a situation where um, school teachers and dental nurses and district nurses, young women would go into the rural areas and they would marry the local farmers and that's how the farm has been kept going. Well, of course, when the crunch hit, um, all these women went back looking for their old jobs and basically they got them. 
I mean, we got Mary and her friends Carolyn Lamp and Nikki Andrews not only became family breadwinners, they were catapulted into political activism. I don't think rural people trust no. like they used to. No. Quite the, same. the women took their concerns to the beehive. The four Rangitiki women came to town to impress on politicians their concern about the farming crisis. They came away feeling there was nothing significant in the pipeline for rural families. Something has to bring about change and to date none of the things that we've tried have done that. So this in fact is our final effort if you like. Today the women's lives are very different. They never want to be as vulnerable again as they were in the mid 80s. They've stayed in their jobs and Carolyn is still politically active. All of our husbands came from farming families and their fathers before them came from farming families and they uh, grew up expecting to go farming and, and their families expected that they would and whole communities expected that their sons would come back and farm the farms their families mm. had been on. And I think that expectation has changed dramatically in rural mm. New Zealand. I mm. rather hope that my sons won't farm, to be honest. It's a wonderful way of life, but it's certainly no way of mm. making a fortune. Well, my 13-year-old daughter, six months ago when she was 12, said to me, Mum, so-and-so, a school friend, a classmate, was moving to another rural town, and um, she said it's going to be quite hard for the family for a year because they'll have a big mortgage. And she knows exactly what that means, she understands. They've all got an understanding of interest rates. Um, yeah, they know costs and what it costs and what it doesn't cost and what you go without and what you can have. Was that different for you? Yeah. Oh, I've never heard I didn't know what a mortgage was till it's about 22 or 23, probably. I think um, some change was necessary. And I think, as a people, um, we all resist change to a degree and um, you know, perhaps find it hard to adapt to some of the things that did happen, but you know, I think some of them were f for the better. There were possibly. downsides to it though, because a lot of rural women were forced into finding off-farm employment mm -hmm. and going out to work, it meant that in fact a lot of the voluntary kind of oh, networks yeah. and mm -hmm. organisations that thrive or did thrive in rural New Zealand suffered dramatically from uh, lack of people able to help. Organisations like small kindergarten or play centre committees mm. and plunket committees mm. and mm. all of those groups that had mm. been a part of life in rural New Zealand for generations really um, found it harder and harder mm. to keep going. Before the revolution young people wanting to be independent business people running their own farms or forests or horticultural units or whatever, uh, were often uh, persuaded to go elsewhere. And a lot of young people went overseas, uh, in my acquaintance, or farms. Now I'm finding that that's reversing, that the ability to be f uh, a free person and make one's own decisions and and a rise or fall upon those decisions relating to the marketplace means that people are picking up challenges all over the place in agriculture and servicing agriculture. And there are lots of wonderful things going on unseen in the New Zealand hinterland. Ian Morton, South Canterbury farmer, has adjusted to the challenge of the new times and the new demand for value-added farming. It's more intensive. We farm a lot more crop, less stock. We have little niche markets that we try and meet and sell to. We further process a lot more of our product. We will load containers for export here and all those sorts of things. We have specialised. We've got less labour and we probably work a lot longer. We earn more dollars than we did a decade ago. Uh, we probably have less left at the end of it. Yeah, well, when I went farming, it was the best thing on the block to do. It was the, one of the best occupations on the block. My children won't go farming at the moment. They have no interest in it. All they've seen is hard work and a lot of heartbreak over that period. I mean, they're going into things like law and engineering and accountancy and that sort of thing. Most people now accept something had to be done. They've adjusted to the revolution. But right from the beginning, there was argument about the way in which things were done. There was a lot of um, 
um, debate you'll recall between 84 and 87 about the right sequencing and all sorts of um, learned people said I had the sequencing wrong. Well, you know, basically I never took an, uh, any notice of that. If I'd waited for the perfect sequence, uh, then by the time I got there, the these people, the same people would be telling me that the sequence by then had changed and I'd have never done, undertaken any reform. I think in politics, it's the art of the possible. You, if you've got an opportunity and you want to undertake reform, do it. There were many who said, OK, let's go there, but let's go there slowly and deliberately. I think if he'd done that, the powers of reaction would have regrouped and he would have been rolled, or the party would have been rolled, or the reformists would have been rolled. So I think he quite consciously had a program. He quite consciously you know, dumped us all in it, uh, knowing that we would then have to react to the circumstances that we now found ourselves to be in. So I think that was, you know, pretty superior management. On one occasion I said to him, Roger, it, the, the speed you're going through these dangerous seas is like a ship dashing through rocks uh, to try and get through a, a gap. You know, for goodness sake, slow it down, navigate, look where the rocks are, we're going to be shipwrecked. And Roger, I can remember, said to me, if I slow down, we will certainly be shipwrecked on the rocks. The only hope is to look at the gap, not worry about what's around us and go for broke. We may go down, but we may get through, but there's no alternative. We could have done the things we did straight away. We would have still had to uh, correct the fiscal situation. I guess after that, if we'd wanted to, we could have stopped the program there. But in the end, we would have had a second-rate country. Our performance wouldn't have been particularly good. But on the other hand, a whole lot of Europe's performance at the moment is not particularly good. So um, it was really a, a real choice whether we were going to make the hard yards. The 1991 mother of all budgets had signalled the end of the revolution. Not only was there outrage from communities battered by change, there was now a legitimate means to express that outrage. The notion of a new kind of electoral system, proportional representation, was part of the revolution of the 80s. Now it would spur a ground-shaking voter backlash, and it happened almost by accident. The whole MMP thing probably goes back to to uh, Geoffrey Palmer, who set up the Royal Commission on Electoral Reform. This, I suppose it's fair to say, wasn't seen as one of Geoffrey's brightest ideas by some people um, in his party, simply because it opened the potential for change of an electoral system that at that stage had served them well. So he provided the conditions for it. It was demonstrably clear, however, that that the majority of the party and of, of the caucus did not want MMP. Quite a number of the ministers were absolutely uh, appalled at the prospect of proportional representation. Mike Moore, Helen Clark, they hated it. Uh, I loved it, some of the others did, but not very many. David Longy didn't like it either, but during the 1987 election campaign he'd made a commitment and got stuck with it. This government supported the move to have the Royal Commission and we will, uh, in the next term, refer that report to a parliamentary select committee. A referendum will thereafter be held. I believe that there will probably be a public acceptance of four-year term and a modified form of proportional representation. We've got a new policy from the Prime Minister. He now supports referenda. That's uh, brand new and it's, we should record it down. Well, the, extraordinary uh, statement. So when, during the campaign, David Longy announced on television that we were having it, I must say that Geoffrey Palmer and I could hardly believe our ears, but very quickly moved to affirm David's good judgment on this issue. As a loyal deputy, I backed him to the hilt immediately and very enthusiastically because uh, it was, uh, I didn't know that he'd been a supporter of it, and of course he wasn't. It was clearly a mistake at the time. I was doing a debate, and I had little key cards, and they were perfectly uh, written key cards, and they had been furnished to me by my staff, and I read them wrongly. And I made a pledge, which I deeply regret, and I am responsible for introducing the concept of MMP by accident, which it undoubtedly is. Give us an M! M! Give us a P! P! What have we got? The National Party committed itself to the policy too. By the time it was back in government, it had cause to regret it. There is more to MMP than meets the eye. Reject MMP. Despite a massive campaign to dissuade the country from voting for MMP, 
the referendum was definitive and prompted a round of party defections which continued through to 1996. MMP hastened the disintegration of the old two-party club. Rugged individualism, the catch cry of the marketplace, had caught on in a way that the reformers hadn't bargained for. A disillusioned electorate seized the opportunity to declare a plague on all your houses. Well, there'd always been a, a suspicion of, of politicians, but you tended to trust your own and dislike the others. And what was new was that uh, you started to distrust your own. Uh, you didn't just distrust and dislike the Nats or the socialists. You now suddenly thought, good God, my side are as bad. Uh, in fact, perhaps worse. I expect this from the other side. I don't expect it from my own. Two referenda were held, the first in 1992. For National's finance minister determined to set a position of strong leadership, her prime minister's commitment to go along with that referendum was one of two major mistakes. I really had fought against two decisions we took that were quite fatal. The first was the decision uh, to say that we would abandon the superannuation surtax. You know, economically it was, it was a bad uh, commitment to make and we should not have made that error. And then it compounded because having lost the moral authority on that issue, Jim privately said to himself, never again am I going to break a promise. No, I can, I can understand that, but that's very human. And so the promise he should have broken to have a referendum on MMP, he went ahead with. And that is even more fatal because it goes to the heart of our ability to get good government. And so those two errors destroyed moral authority of the party. That might be one thing. Parties come and go in a democracy. You expect that. But to destroy your capacity for good government of whatever colour, that is a sin of a completely different nature. Right, running on the spot. In her first term as finance minister, Ruth Richardson had pushed the reforms to new heights, despite the discomfort of her prime minister. But the 1993 election and referendum results caused real alarm. Long before the government was re-elected, the writing was on the wall. National now wanted to project a warmer, friendlier image. It's the role of a finance minister to come up with the goods. I mean, my role was to bring home the bacon, not to be the nation's pin-up girl, not to be popular, hopefully to be respected. Uh, that wasn't my role. My role was to create the stuff of which an attractive campaign could be made. And the campaign needed to be about, you know, a vision of an even better future, building on our gains, taking New Zealand forward. It had to be a promise of, of better things to come and why it was worth making the effort. Instead, we pretty much portrayed a, you know, look, this is in the bag. In fact, Jim said on the Thursday night before the election, effectively, this is in the bag. And the voters at that moment, on Thursday night before the Saturday election, said, no, sunshine, we believe you should continue to govern, but we're going to put you on a short leash. Damn right we are. Nationals scraped back in with a majority of one, but Ruth Richardson was out of cabinet. The Prime Minister had reasserted a conservative approach, effectively, the revolution was over. He had by then made up his mind that, that if the government survived, it certainly wasn't going to have uh, this reform at the heart of it. He'd made up his mind that we've done enough, you know, the job's largely complete, uh, and he was reverting to type. And I don't think that type was attractive. It's taken three weeks for Prime Minister Jim Bolger to announce Ruth Richardson must leave finance. That's the message he believes the election delivered. I do not believe I would be too far from the truth if I expressed it something like this. We, the New Zealand people, accept that our nation had to change. The process was painful, but the benefits are now apparent and must be retained. However, we believe the time has come to recognise that the big moves are behind us and a different style of management is called for. I deeply regret that the Prime Minister has chosen to remove me from the finance portfolio. In October 1996, New Zealand voted against revolutions. It was a new territory we wanted to occupy somewhere closer to the centre line. But since 1984, that centre line has shifted, and New Zealand has shifted with it. The election result is a minor correction to the course we set out on 12 years ago. What were once new freedoms 
are now built into the landscape. What was once a radical shift is now business as usual. L.P. Hartley once wrote, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. The New Zealand of the 70s and early 80s is like another country now. Nine years of revolution wrought changes in almost every aspect of our lives. Some changes were inevitable. Technology, communications, international imperatives would have forced them on us sooner or later. Other changes we demanded, because isolation was no longer a barrier to new ideas. We learned a tolerance for different lifestyles. We cast off the cultural cringe and found a unique voice in movies, literature and the arts. We developed a street life began to enjoy ourselves. We found new heroes and celebrated being winners. We forged an independent identity as clean, green and nuclear free. And we survived a revolution which gave us a new reputation in some circles as the very model of a modern market-driven economy. It was a revolution in terms of our international perception. It was a revolution in terms of repositioning ourselves in the South Pacific, of orienting towards Asia, of making all the adjustments which we had forsworn from even looking at for so many years after they had become a pressing, urgent matter. And because it all happened so quickly, you get a lot of bewilderment, you get a lot of people who are basically meat and three veg, quarter acre New Zealanders, who find themselves eating dim sums with chopsticks and they can't cope. Yes, it's, it's a revolution in the whole political culture and the value system of New Zealand. And, and this was what I, I don't think a lot of people realised. It wasn't just an economic revolution or um, uh, a governmental revolution or, or, or a political process revolution. It was a revolution also in terms of, of values and, and community. It was a pity that we had to have so much change in the 80s. Why we had so much change in the 80s was that we had stultified our society for 40 years after the war. And we were having to do in a short period what most other countries had done much more gradually. But the point is there was no alternative, there was no other way. Oh yes, well that's a nonsense, there is no alternative policy. <clears throat> there are always alternative policies, lots of them. And what government is about is to choose the best one. Now they didn't do that badly, don't get me wrong. There was a consensus, a constituency for those changes that happened. The fundamental change in ideas was there in the community or they couldn't have achieved it. But shuddering reforms to the economy had a price. The egalitarian dream of that other country was eroded as the poverty gap widened. We watched as some of the gurus of the free market were exposed in sordid tales of greed and corruption. As the state receded from our lives, the guarantee of full employment disappeared. The revolution did violence to many lives and left its scars. But I think what is remarkable about the New Zealand experience is the extent to which the pain, uh, the unfairness, the inequality has been celebrated, not just as a price that's necessary to be paid, but as a badge of uh, merit. Uh, this shows, it's, it's said, or thought, this shows that it's working. I mean, the other great legacy of the 80s is, in fact, you know, grossly um, excessive inequalities where 10% of the population um, 
was massively enriched, most of the population actually barely, you know, stood still in, in material terms, and the bottom 20 per cent lost ground substantially. People are being told they have to look after their education, they have to look after their health, they have to look after their retirement. And so the younger generation are saying, well, why should I worry about looking after anyone else? I've got to look after myself, they can look after themselves too. And I think there is a, uh, perhaps a, a callousness coming in to our society now. People have got to be the key resource to this New Zealand economy. We don't have raw materials. It turns out that a lot of things we believe about our farming sector are not true when we actually compare them with international um, farming um, trends. You know, we've believed for years that we could grow things faster and more efficiently, but now that we're actually getting hard measures of that, we don't grow everything faster and more efficiently, and we don't produce things that necessarily everybody in the world wants to eat. So even in those areas where we thought we had an, a kind of extra advantage, we don't have. Our extra advantage is in our people. Our people are now many. New market imperatives demanded recognition of our place in the wider Pacific Rim. They released a wave of foreign immigration which has strained social cohesion. New cultural layers bred new resentments, just as we were coming to terms with our own unique bicultural partnership and finding solutions to the grievances of the past. We declared the Treaty of Waitangi the founding document of the nation. I think the Tainu tribe is probably one, one major example of what can happen when finally after more than a century and a half they've finally put behind them these grievances which they've been carried. Now, you, you see Tainu nowadays, they're all smiling, beaming, psychologically they're uplifted, um, economically they're certainly, uh, uh, there's an advantage to them, but they're using that advantage by educating their young people. So I think uh, that's good for New Zealand society because it's, uh, it allows Māori to contribute to New Zealand society in a much more productive way than we have in the past. Many of the changes that took place during that period in fact have altered our concept as a country with a distinct national identity. And it's absolutely no surprise at all to me anyway, and I'm sure to others, that issues of sovereignty, which at this stage are associated with Māori, but I think are actually go way beyond that, are in fact going to be the issues, I think, of the future. We were told the revolution was necessary to secure a better future, that the pain would bring gains. But the jury is still out. Unemployment remains higher than it was before the reforms. Economic growth is a sluggish 2.5%. Average productivity has risen just 5%. And income inequality here is said to be second only to the UK. The health system appears to be in chaos. Our children are more at risk from preventable diseases than they've ever been. Some of them arrive at school without breakfast and leave without skills. Others arrive in a new car with their own cell phone. Did the revolution mean a better future for just some? Was it benign or malign? Oh no, the revolution wasn't malign. Certainly not intended to be malign. And there are some people who have done very well out of it. People who don't want the government in their lives and get on with it, for this has been a bonanza. For people who are disabled, uh, limited, uh, resourceless, uneducated, it has been a tragedy. The architects of the revolution in New Zealand have gone from centre stage, consumed by the process they started. As the country moves into a new political landscape, they too feel nostalgia for what might have been. I mean, I certainly regretted the fact that uh, a government which I felt could have um, been in government probably 12, 15 years at least, had, had fallen apart uh, so easily. Uh, I regretted the fact, uh, more particularly, that we hadn't finished the job, that in a sense uh, we'd got 60% uh, along the road and, and uh, then left uh, the job unfinished. I often write about the period and I do so with wistfulness rather than triumph. Uh, it is a period which was absolutely significant in New Zealand's history. It was a period which was calling out for the government we had in 1984-7. And it was a chance to have a long-term government of calculated intelligence where the social richness of New Zealand could have been enhanced because of its economic wealth and where the obsession for money overran any form of 
political, social, human sense. The first MMP government will be a testing ground for the values on which we want to base our future. The years of the revolution have become part of our past, part of a foreign country. As the millennium approaches, we're learning to do things differently here. Everybody is. It's always been the case that New Zealand First was going to hold the balance of power on election night. MMP doesn't speed anything up, one would have to say, as an observation. This program was made with the help of your broadcasting fee so that you can see more of New Zealand on air.